a surprise. Um, so, today is Friday. It's always good when it's a Friday because you know what comes after Friday? Saturday. And, uh, yeah. So, but, um, this is a good way to end the Friday because everybody knows this class is lots of fun. Okay? So, um, so we're gonna, so, so, we're now, uh, prepare yourselves for 15 minutes of, of entertainment and fun. Okay? In which we'll talk about probability distribution. Okay? So let me go over to the uh, document camera and pick it up from here. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Okay, so today we're on a uh, lot. Today is um, uh, Friday. I just said that. So we're, oh, today we're supposed to hand in the homework, actually. And um, uh, we're supposed to do section 3.4. So. Okay, so we were on 3.3. .3. Okay, so section 3 is causal models, right? And, uh, <clears throat> okay, so we talked, uh, just to review really quickly, okay, um, so we talked about this model where we would have A, okay, in the matrix I minus H, and when you multiply A by X, you get the prediction X, okay? Now the cool, the A has a number of properties which make it interesting. One is that it's lower triangular, okay? Another is that it has ones on the diagonal. The lower triangularity is, 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 a, is a result of the fact that it's causal, okay? And, it's, uh, and the fact that it has ones on the diagonal, well that's a result of the fact that you always subtract the current value from the, you subtract from the current value the previous value. So you, you, the current values always get added with a, with a weight of one, okay? Plus one, right? So, uh, and, but then there's the implication that the determinant of A is one, okay? So the fact that the determinant of A, of A is one turns out to be very important because it means you can write down the probability distribution of X in closed form. Uh, and this is the form, okay? So we can look at this, and you know, if you hang around these long enough, eventually you start looking at things like this and they mean something, okay? Um, because uh, you start developing intuition, okay? And um, uh, so what happens here is that, here that's A times X. So X is the signal. When you multiply A by X, what does that produce? That produces the prediction error, right? So what you're really doing is you're taking the interproduct of the prediction error, okay, with this weighting matrix, lambda inverse. Lambda is a diagonal matrix, so really all you're doing is taking each sample uh, of the prediction error, you're squaring it, and you're multiplying it by the inverse weight, lambda. Well, each of those diagonal lambdas is the variance. So you're normalizing each sample by its variance. By its variance. So you're taking the squared error, normalizing it by its variance. So the resulting normalized value should, on average, be one, right? right. So uh, that's that's the thing that goes in here, and, and that's the probability distribution for the whole thing. Now, this normalizing constant isn't super important most of the time. Okay. Sometimes it's important, but you can always figure out what it is because you know that from the structure of this thing. You know that normally it would be the determinant. This thing here has got to be the inverse covariance matrix, right? Because in the in the general form of a Gaussian distribution, the general form of a Gaussian distribution is um, is uh, p of I don't know whatever it's going to be. Uh, I won't use x, well, I'll use x, but don't compute it with the other x. It's going to be 1 over z, where I don't feel like taking the time to write that out, and the exponential of minus 1 half x transpose r inverse x, right? Where um, I'm assuming it's zero mean here, right? So r inverse is always that matrix there. If this is a Gaussian distribution, then this is always an exponential of a quadratic form, and that quadratic matrix, that matrix there, is always the inverse covariance, right? Now, um, so if I go back here and look at uh, uh, at this, what I was looking at, oh, this uh, this right here, 
this matrix here is thought of being inverse covariant. So the inverse covariant R inverse is equal to A transpose lambda inverse N. Okay. Now, remember, in the, experiment, in the normalizing constant here, you have the determinant of R. But the determinant of R, well, it's going to be the product of the determinant of these matrices. But the determinant of A is 1. Just to make sure everybody's awake. Mm -hmm. A is the determinant is 1, right? So this whole thing is the determinant of lambda inverse. Because the determinant of lambda inverse is the inverse of the determinant of lambda. Hmm. That sounds like it could be like the name of a song or something like that. Or maybe it could be like the, the refrain in a song, you know? Mm -hmm. We could have like a little band set up to do that. But, okay, maybe that's the later. But anyway, okay, so that's what this is, okay? Good. And you read the notes and you saw the book, right? So, okay. So, um, okay, now, the fact that the lambda the lambda is a diagonal matrix, but its diagonal entries are not necessarily constant because the prediction variance might be different from time to time. If you have an auto autoregressive model, but that means that the prediction predictor and the prediction variance is, is no longer a function of time. Okay. So, um, so you have a filter here, and it's a time invariant filter. It moves along at a prediction value, and you subtract that predicted value from the current value, and that's the prediction error, right? And then, uh, okay, and then, so, uh, the predictor now is going to be a linear time invariant uh, operator. Okay. So then it's just convolution. The convolution, but well, you have to start somewhere. Okay. So it's truncated called convolution. And when you multiply the convolution, um, uh, well, you have, everybody knows about circular convolution, right? Circular convolution is what happens when you have an FFT. Um, so, there's, just, there's two concepts that come up that are very important. One is the concept of a toughless matrix, and the other is a circular matrix. So, everybody's read this, right? Okay. So, um, when you have a toughless matrix, you need to have one function, and, and the, each row is just a shifted version of the function. So if you go along diagonals, it's constant. Okay. So it's like you're taking a function and you're shifting it, and if you shift the function, you're just windowing out a piece of it. Okay? Yeah? So uh, h1 and h minus 1, are they the negative of each other? No. But they could be anything. Right, right. Okay. Because it, that's the um, notation, right? So, and my notation varies a little bit, but sometimes, so here I have, sometimes it's a discrete, and this is kind of signal processing notation. You write h sub n, right? It, it's the same as saying h of n. It's like a function of, okay? But in discrete time signals, um, this is sort of common notation to use subscript to be a functional dependence on, okay? So is it like minus one, like a minus one step in the past? Exactly. Okay. So, right. By the way, that's precisely the kind of question that's good to ask because it's exactly the kind of simple thing that can really confuse math, right? So, uh, so you have h minus one, h minus two, and then you have h one, oops, h one, h two, dot dot dot, right? Now the reason that you say, well, why is this not h plus one? Because this is convolution. So if you remember convolution, you have to do the flip and shift thing, right? Do you remember about convolution? You, your background may not be signal processing, so let me just say this real fast. When you do, so if you look at like uh, when you, there's a, so if you have a, a, a linear system, I'm going to give you like an entire course in undergraduate linear systems in like two sentences, okay? So you have an input, x of n, right? And the impulse response of the system is h of n. And the output is y of n, okay? So it, what is an impulse response? You know what an impulse is? An impulse, we talk, I think we talked about this. That's when um, an impulse is delta of n is equal to 1 for n equals 0, and it's equal to 0 for n not equal to 0. That's called an impulse, okay? And, yeah, oh, I'm off the screen. Yeah, thank you. Let me back up. Okay, so, uh, so that's an impulse. 
If you put an impulse in the system, the output is the so-called impulse response, okay? And A sub n is the impulse response. So A sub n is the output you get if, say, the system is P, and you put in an impulse delta T and into it, okay? Okay. So it turns out that, that um, you can actually go to my webpage from when I teach undergraduate course called 301, and you can turn all 301 if you study really hard in like about 15 minutes by reading one page, which is entitled Dr. Bowman's um, uh, a five-step program to success in E301. Okay. Is that really? Is that really what it's called? It's, it's on my web page. Okay. <laughs> I can go find it. Hold on for a second. Uh, um, see, you guys egg me on. You know my weaknesses, right? Hold on. Uh, hold on. Okay. So. Oh, that's pretty. Bowman. Okay. I haven't taught this in a long time. Oh, come on. So, come on. So, 301, 301. And notes. And five step program to success. Oops. Okay. Dr. Bowman's easy five step program to success in E301. Okay? Hold on. Okay, first, all linear systems obey superposition, okay? Two, the output of a linear system is given by, oops, hold on, see if things are a little funky. Computer is really slow. Okay, the output of a linear system, a linear time variable system is given by the convolution of the input with the system's impulse response. That's what I was just going to tell you, okay? Where, okay, in discrete time it looks like this, in continuous time it looks like that. This is the so-called, the signal processing people, the electrical engineers generally know a lot about, in their undergraduate days they hear a lot about flip and shift, okay? It's a little bit, I like to say it's a little bit like shake and bake, okay? It's just different, okay? So the flip and shift works like this. You take the, the eight function, which is the impulse response, and you flip it. It flips because you see you, your summing over k is minus k, and the shifting comes because of the end. You can kind of work through this, but you can see that in in the end what happens, and then you multiply that by x and you sum. Okay, so uh, okay, and since we're here, we'll go through the rest of three hundred one. Okay, if you put a sine wave input into a linear time invariant uh, system, it produces a sine wave output, but with a different amplitude and phase. Okay. That's called frequency response, okay? And you can prove that. It's a real simple thing to prove. And then any signal can be represented as a sum of sine waves. This is really important. That's called the Fourier transform, okay? And you can, there's lots of different forms of the Fourier transform. There's the continuous time Fourier transform. There's the Fourier series expansion. There's the discrete time Fourier transform. And there's the discrete time Fourier series expansion, which is called the DFT. The DFT is a misnomer, okay? And uh, because it, it should have been called the discrete time Fourier theory, okay? But, you know, life isn't perfect, so that's what it's called. If you call it the discrete time Fourier theory, there is no one will know what you're talking about, okay? So you have to call it the DFT. And then you say, any linear time invariant system can be analyzed by separating the input into sine waves, finding the response of the system to each sine wave, and adding the individual's responses together. So this is combining the superposition, the fact that you can represent signals as a sine wave, and the fact that the response of a system to a single sine wave only changes its amplitude and phase. Okay? So that means that the result is that's the concept of frequency response. And that's where you get the modulation transfer function. Okay? So now we've covered all of um, uh, linear systems. Uh, in, in a heartbeat. Okay? So now, where's the document now? Oh, there it is. Okay. So now, flip and shift works like this. You have the one signal. Okay. You have the one signal. Okay. So one of my things is one signal. Okay? And this is the impulse response. And it just, this works out. If you spend enough time thinking about it, you take the impulse response, you flip it over, and then you slide it across the other signal, and at each point you take the inner product, and that's the output of the linear system, okay? Now you know everything there is to know about undergraduate electrical engineering. What's your background? Uh, computer programming. 
Oh, okay, okay. So now you can get an electrical engineering degree. <laughs> okay, good. So now, okay, good. So, okay, so this is the operator. Okay, so that's why these are ordered in reverse order because of the whole flip and shift thing, okay? You'll want to go down and really think about this hard, okay? Make sure you got all drill in your brain. Okay, now, now there's two things that can happen. Um, if, you, uh, if you're doing convolution to a signal of infinite length and you just truncate your incoming signal, and you truncate the output of the signal, okay? And, and, um, and uh, then, and if you truncate the input and you truncate the output, what you'll get is you'll get um, this, uh, 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 an operator which is equivalent to multiplying by this total matrix. So this isn't exactly convolution. It's like convolution. It differs only what happens on the boundaries. In convolution, there are no boundaries because the signal is assumed to go to infinity. Okay? But here, um, we have to truncate things because we're talking about a, 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 a finite length signal. So you have to do something. So the question is, well, how do you handle the boundaries? The same issue happens when you filter an image. Everybody who's 637 knows this. The first class I have you do is image filtering, and everybody panics and they come to me after class and they go, what do I do with the boundaries? And I, and I say, do anything you want, I don't really care this time, okay? But it makes them think about it. Well, I have to do something at the boundaries, okay? So one thing you can do is truncate things at the boundaries. Another thing you can do is wrap around the boundaries. So in wrap around, what you do is this. You have, like, you have a, the signals like this, okay? Oh, hold on, let me get a smaller signal. Hold on. That's a smaller signal. <laughs> The signal is like this, and then what you do is you take the signal and you wrap it around, and you attach the two ends together, right? So, okay? So this is, I always like, okay, you're going to have to indulge me on this because I like doing this, okay? Um, so what happens is that, I hope you haven't had to hear this too many times before, but I, when you play video games, one of my favorite video games is, um, uh, what is it called? The thing with the little rocket ships that are spaced like triangles? Asteroids. Asteroids. By the way, I don't know if you know this guy, but this was the first video game, okay? Yeah. Because it, it gets, uh, it could you, you could play on a Tektronix 4014 terminal, okay? Where it had like a raster drawing thing with it, okay? So when the asteroid, when the rocket ship goes off the end, where does it come back? It comes back over here, right? And actually that always used to cause problems for me, because what would happen is I'd go off like the edge here, like here, right? And then what I wouldn't realize is over here there was an asteroid and I crashed into it, okay? So um, that was one of the talents you needed to be good at that game. I never was very good at it. But anyway, I did enjoy it. So, so that's called a, a, a toroidal boundary or circular boundary condition. And a toroid, so a circular boundary condition is implemented with a circulant matrix, okay? Now mostly circulant matrices are not physically uh, realistic. But sometimes they are. I mean, there are certain cases in which the real signal is circular in structure. <coughs> but often it's not. But even if it's even even if it's not physically realistic, it's useful mathematically. Okay, because the circular matrix has structure which is uh, uh, very valuable. Okay, it, first of all, the circular matrix is an approximation to the topless matrix, and the circular matrix has an exact decomposition, de diagonalization. It can be decomposed with an FFT, okay? So we, can, we know that we can do circular convolution. So you take Xn and you convolve with Hn, and that'll be Yn, okay? But now this isn't convolution, it's circular convolution, right? Now everybody knows that everybody who's an electrical engineering background knows that one way to do this is you do the DFT. Now, if you are an electrical engineer, okay, so when you go, if you go into a software package, every software package has the DFT, okay? But they usually don't call it the DFT. What do they usually call it? FFT. They call it the FFT, okay? So probably everybody's heard of an FFT, right? It's called the Fast Fourier Transform. It's kind of a misnomer because the FFT is the fast implementation of the DFT. But there, most people don't realize that. They just think it's the, DF, the FFT, okay? So you take the FFT of X of N, okay, and that would be, say, we'll call it X tilde K, okay? And then you take the FFT of 
8 of n, and we'll say that 8 tilde k, and you take the FFT of uh, y of n, and that's y tilde k, and it turns out that uh, and then x tilde k times h tilde k equals y tilde k. So in the standard parlance of the field, you say that the FFT turns circular convolution into multiplication. Okay? So a lot of people think that you can take do convolution with the FFT. Okay? Well, you can directly do convolution. So they think the FFT to implement convolution. It doesn't. It implements circular convolution. Now, they can be the same in certain cases as long as you're careful about how you do padding and your signals are finite and there's a lot of ifs and buts. But you've got to keep that straight because that's an important difference. So, circular matrices are important because they can be implemented with FFTs and FFTs have much lower complexity. There are only n log n complexity instead of n squared. And the other thing is that uh, then what that really means, and this is going to be a homework problem, that the eigenvalues in this matrix are the FFT coefficient of the one row of the matrix. Okay? That's approximately, I mean, that's, that's sort of true. I mean, there's a lot of weird technical little conditions. You have to reinterpret the words in my sentence properly and redefine the word is. Okay? But, but it's basically true, okay? In the actual homework problem, you go through it and get a precise statement of what exactly is true, okay? So you take one of these rows, the FFT of one of these rows is the eigenvalues of that matrix. So that's a very useful thing to know, because sometimes you want to know what the eigenvalues of the matrix are, okay? So, okay. So, um, all right. So, um, so that's all good. Um, oh, and then the other thing I want to say is this. Okay, now I'm really getting a little out of the term. That it asymptotically, okay, as the matrix gets large, uh, assuming that there's a single fixed, uh, properly technically constrained uh, function here that forms the kernel, then the eigenvalues of the public matrix will converge to the eigenvalues of the circular matrix. You know, if there's any justice in the world, which there isn't, um, then these two should converge to each other, right? Because um, because, I mean, come on, the only thing that's different is the boundary, right? And it's just, if the signal gets big enough, eventually the amount of, it's like, it's like when you ask me, what else should I do on the boundaries when I filter the image? I say, well, it doesn't really matter that much, okay? Because eventually, if the signal window gets large enough, then it doesn't matter that much what happens to the boundary. So the eigenvalues of these two things have to converge. And the, there's a formal proof of that, and it's, it's important in a lot of things. It's actually fundamental to things like rate distortion coding theory something like that, okay? But if, if you... Did Tesla develop this theory in the context of Fourier transform? I don't know. Because it looks like something a kid would do, right? It's just draw the same number down the diagonal? I don't know. I, I, I don't know anything. As, I'm not much... As, as an engineer, I'm not much of a historian, you know what I mean? But if he, I would really like to know, actually. I mean, I don't want, I don't mean to, like, punish you for your question, but maybe you want to go off and do a little research and then get back to us on it, okay? Because I'd be kind of curious to know, but but I, I think the theory about the convergence of the eigenvalues was done by a guy named Grenander relatively recent, recent history. Uh, uh, so, uh, like, in the last, I don't know, 50 years or whatever. So, I don't know. Topless, I'm assuming, was around a long time ago, but I'm not exactly sure what's the future of um, uh, Okay. So, okay. So, now, if, now, strictly speaking, uh, okay, the constraint on an AR process is a little more sophisticated than my said. It's not just that it's a, a stationary random process. Okay, it's also that, technically speaking, the prediction filter has finite order. So you only use the last p value to predict the next one. Okay? So, um, this theory, and so if it's a stationary random process, then, okay, if you let p go to infinity, you can model any process, any Gaussian random process, with arbitrarily high accuracy. Because, if you had a stationary guessing process, then you could the conditional probability of a pick of a value given its path 
is going to be a linear combination of the, of the past values, but it's going to be a linear combination of all the past values. And that linear combination is going to be invariant to position because you assume it was stationary. So as long as you have a stationary Gaussian random process, you're sort of not making any assumption here. The only assumption you're making is that the order of the filter is finite, P. So an AR model assumes a finite order, okay? But that's really not much of an assumption because if, if you let get P get large enough, you can get as close to accurate as you want, okay? So, okay. So uh, AR processes are pretty, um, are pretty generic and useful. Um, let's see. Uh, and then what happens is you can go through some calculations, and I'll let you do this. Uh, but basically, the power spectrum of the a random process is, is given by this, where sigma c squared is the, um, this is equation 3.10, okay? Sigma c squared is the prediction variance, okay? And 1 minus h there is the Fourier transform of the impulse response, so it's the frequency response of the filter, right? And then 1 minus that squared, then, you divide by that, and that's the power spectrum. And, and the logic for this is actually pretty simple, which is this. So, um, uh, that you have an incoming signal, X of N, right? And then it goes in, okay, and you take that and you you filter with uh, a, a, a filter H of N, right? And you subtract that. And the result is F1 N, right? Okay. And now, what ha well, the inverse filter to that is this. You take epsilon n, and you take uh, x of n, and you um, add this, right? Okay, so this is the inverse of that. I mean, it, it's really easy to show that because this is x of n is equal to x of n minus this is x of n convolved with this h of n. Uh, let me zoom out. All right. So I could just algebraically move this onto the other side of the equation, and I get that um, I get that x of n is equal to x of n plus x of n convolved with h of n. So by just taking this algebraic relationship and moving this on the other side, I get the inverse operator, okay? So these are inverses, and it's easy enough to show that the frequency response, this, this is the so-called IR filter, and its frequency response is 1 over 1 minus h of omega, where um, h of omega is the Fourier transform of the impulse response, right? And then the incoming signal here is white noise. So its power spectrum is sigma uh, epsilon squared, right? And then the power spectrum result is sigma epsilon squared times this squared, because that's got to be the power spectrum of x. So we, uh, if the power spectrum of x is the power spectrum of e times the filter's response squared, magnitude squared, okay? I know that for some of you this is a very tutorial, but I just want to make sure I touch on all the very people who, so we'll all get off the screen. Okay? Is, is this all clear then? And, and you should also, I, I know I can't say it enough, okay? I'm sorry. I'm a very repetitive individual. Uh, that, uh, you've got to read the notes, okay? Yeah. Do you have a question? Okay. Good mm -hmm. uh, when you said that the piece order uh, insulin impulse response greater, uh, the response of that, as p, p goes to infinity, converges to the random variable of that particular. In what sense? Well, I'm saying if you can take, if you have any stationary, okay, if you have, if xn is, um, if xn is a stationary Gaussian, zero mean, zero mean is kind of a minor thing. You can always subtract both the mean. But if it's stationary Gaussian zero mean, right, then x hat of n, the prediction for the, this will always be uh, a linear function, uh, say h of 
N minus I, or something like this, or no, I should say I minus N, right? Of, uh, of, uh, uh, no, 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 I'll do it like this. Okay, sorry, I'm doing this on the fly. Sum from, say, K equals a zero to infinity, right, of A to K times X of, or one infinity, of X of N minus K, right? But that's just convolution. So it's got to be like this form because it's got to be, if it's a stationary in the process, then the predictor, the optimal predictor, can't be a function of time, right? right? See, now, if people don't understand the concept of stationarity, and I gave a homework question, or an exam question, I said, okay, is, is, the, uh, is the linear predictor, this is a stationary in the process, is the optimal linear prediction a, a, a function of time, okay? And then they like get the definition of stationary out, and they start doing autocorrelations and writing up, and then they would go nuts, okay? And you say, oh, and they would come back like six hours later, they'd say, oh my God, Professor Rowland, it was so hard. I worked with it for like six hours, and, and you know, I got like 17 pages of calculations. And I said, well, what are you talking about? It's like a three-line proof, okay? <laughs> okay? So if you understand the concept of stationarity, it's much simpler than if you just try to bludgeon your way through the set of equations. But the, the concept basically says the distribution is not a function of time. So if the distribution is not a function of time, the conditional expectation can't be a function of time. And the conditional expectation is a linear operator, so that means it has to be a linear operator that's not a function of time. And that means it's convolution. Right? Now, so now what happens is the only thing is that that goes to infinity. So the only distinction between a Gaussian random process and a stationary and an AR process is that in an AR process, that's finite. But it could be really big. It could be a Googleplex square. Okay? So essentially, as in some sense, as P goes to infinity, you can get arbitrarily close. Right. And that's in the sense of distribution uh, It's in a variety. Uh, it's in a yes. It, the distribution it can get arbitrarily close. Yeah. In the sense of the autocorrelation of the distribution becomes arbitrarily close. Yeah. Where the, the, the power spectrum and the SR are, are, are close. Or yeah, there's two random processes of convergent distribution. Because although it's strictly stationary process, it's going to go any stricter than the convergent uh, system in terms of distribution. Like, you know, so I don't know what other kind of convergence you have. Because the process, I mean, you don't have it on a sure convergence because the process is certainly not on the surely people in The distribution is so, okay, good. It's important to get clear on some of these really basic points. Okay, so now, uh, now I think here we just have like some calculations. So you say, oh, well, this is kind of interesting. You say, oh, well, you just say, well, can you write down the distribution of the AR model? Well, yeah, you can, just like we did it before. But now it's got a little more explicit form because the prediction error then is just, this is the prediction error, all right? The, the prediction error has to be white if the random process is AR. If it's not AR, then, then the prediction error is not be white. But, but if it is AR of order P, then the prediction error will be white. And the means they're independent and identically dis distributed. They're Gaussian, so they'll be independent and all have the same variance, okay? So I divide by that variance, sigma squared root 2. And I multiply, uh, I, I, I sum over this, that's equivalent to multiplying the probabilities because they're all independent. And that's the distribution of S, okay? So now um, what you can do is you can say, oh, well, okay, I'm going to define these two statistics, okay? Uh, well, I'm going to define some notation, okay? I define H here as a set of parameters. It's the filter parameter. It's the vector of filter parameters. What, how many parameters does this thing have? It has P filter parameters, it has one more parameter. What's the other parameter? It's sigma C. So the model is parameterized by sigma C and the filter coefficient, H and N. Okay, those are the parameters of the model. And it's asking, compute the maximum likely estimate of the prediction filter and the prediction variance. Join Okay? So we want to maximize the log likelihood. So, okay, so that's one parameter. 
this is a statistic, because that's a function of the data. Okay? And now we can grind through, and I'll let you go through this, and you can write down the distribution in this form. R hat and B hat, every hat in quantity is a random variable, because it's a function of the data. The unhatted quantities are the parameters. Okay? So A is the parameter, sigma C is the parameter. Okay? So now, if I want to calculate the maximum likelihood estimate, what do I have to do? I maximize this log likelihood with, with respect to the parameters. I'm not going to do that here. You can do that at home, in the comfort of your own home. Okay? But, the way you go about doing this is you first, um, you first, let me see, you first maximize with respect to, to H. Okay? Okay? And then you maximize with respect to sigma C. Okay? And, uh, uh, and and the answer comes out to be this, okay? So uh, uh, this is the zero, right, okay. So the answer comes out to be this. So it's totally intuitive. This is um, just the sample autocorrelation of, um, so R hat is the sample, oh, I'm sorry, these are the definitions of this one, okay. You, here's the derivative, I'm thinking this stuff. Okay, here you compute these derivatives. This is the thing, and the answer comes out to be this: that the maximum likely estimate of H is R uh, hat inverse times B. So it's basically this is like the least squared. This is very closely related to the least squared linear regression. Okay, so that's not that's really intuitive. And then the actual va the optimal value of sigma C has this form. So the other way of thinking about this more intuitive is you just calculate the squared prediction error that you actually got when you plug in the correct value of H and the average of those is going to be sigma squared, C squared, right? I mean, it, okay, so if you were going to guess what the maximum likelihood, the, the estimates of the prediction variance and the prediction filter are, what do you do? Well, you, for the prediction filter, you do a least squared uh, estimate of the predictor. And, and then, with that least squares estimate of the predictor, you can see what your prediction variance, your average prediction variance was, and that turns out to be the maximum likelihood estimate, okay? So this should be very intuitive. Are there any questions on that? Does this make sense? I'm kind of getting a little bit of that glazed over look that I get from people when they want to pretend that they understand something that they're not sure. If you're, uh, if you're trying to figure out like the H hat is going to give you the weighting for your past values, right? Right. Right. Okay, now if you're trying to figure out what the next, and it's stationary, right? Yeah. So shouldn't the weightings be something like just one or something like that? No. Oh. So, so, um, okay. So, so, here, yes. Okay, good. Thank you for asking that question. So what happens if you have a bunch of samples, right? And you want to predict this value. So you're going to take, you could sort of maybe convince yourself, although it's not true, okay, that the sum of the weights should be one, but it's actually not true. In fact, you could prove that the sum of the weights will always be less than one. But it, so let's say this. Let's say you wanted to uh, predict the value of, you know, the stock market tomorrow. Well, Chris, that's a bad choice because the sum is for sure not the case that it depends on that. Okay. Um, your, uh, your, uh, so you're like tracking some object, okay? Okay. And you want to predict, well, where is it going to be here? There's a stationary there, right? Is a stationary around the problem, correct? So the location of the object is just stationary around the process. Yeah. Okay. So what will happen is that well, you might say, well, I'll just use the last value. But, it, but you say, well, but it might be kind of noisy. We want to average some set of the previous values. Right. But, the, but are they going to all be uh, multiplied by one? Definitely not. Because you might want the sum of the weights to be one. Okay. But even that's not because if it's a zero mean random process, then it tends to regress to the mean, which is zero. So the sum of weights goes a little bit less than one. And intuition, okay? But all this intuition is deeply flawed because it's, 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 it's a kind of a conventional case 
which assumes that the random process is Gaussian and low pass power spectrum. Okay? You could have a high pass power spectrum where the random process would do this. Every other, they would be anti correlated. Okay? So every other one, so the next one is likely to have the opposite value. Okay? So all this theory works out in the most general case. So in general, you'll take some set of previous values, the last p value, you'll weight them appropriately with optimal weight, and you'll predict the current value. Okay? And that's what H is, and the optimal estimate for it is this. Okay? And that accounts for, it, it, look at what it concludes. It includes B. B is the correlation between the current value and the previous value, but it's not just a function of the correlation. So, you know, this is one of those things when you just start thinking about your first reaction is like, well, maybe it's one, okay? And then your second reaction is, oh no, it's not one, maybe it's B, okay? It's not B either. B would be the correlation, but the problem is, is that not only are the samples correlated with the value you're trying to predict, they're correlated with each other. And that's why you often need this thing R. And the intuition here is that when you multiply by R inverse, you're whitening the signal. It's a little more complex than that, but, it's, but let me leave. That gives you, that, that's why it's there, okay? So, but you can study that, okay? But I just want you to be aware that there's a problem, okay? The first step to solving, to, the first step to recovery is acknowledging the problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had a question about uh, example 3.1, which I think you're just going through. Yeah. Um, so when you first set up the density function. I'm sorry, 3.1. 3.1. Is that a question? Example 3.1. Uh, this is the one. Oh, okay. Yeah, we were just talking about that. Okay. So in the density function there at the bottom of the page. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so in the, like, so the xn minus the sum over p, like right. the, the, the interior sum there, that looks an awful lot like the expression for the uh, epsilon n, which is given 3.11. Yes. But is that kind of, that it, but that's, is that correct? You're not just substituting in the expression for epsilon n into there, are you? Is that? Yes. That's right? Yeah. So but the epsilon n, if the h's are, are the true h's, then these epsilon n's are independent, identically distributed, Gaussian random variables with unit with uh, variance sigma t squared, okay, and mean yeah. zero, okay. Now you say if I plug this in, I'd be calculating the probability density for f one n, not x, but the relationship between those is a constant of one. And the reason it's a constant of one, why is it a constant of one? I'm making the one here. What's, what's the constant of one? Why is it the multiplicative constant one? So here you have x1, right? You're using the probability distribution for x1. You're plugging in the x1 you would get from the x, okay? So, okay. okay. And that's equal to y, okay? But why is, am I using that? Because I'm probably, the probability of x Right? Um, x is equal to this times an appropriate constant which involves okay. the Jacobian of the transformation. But that's one. Okay. That's one. Right. Ah. That's why I was going kind of nuts telling you that the critical thing is in causal prediction, you have a lower triangular matrix. Okay? And the determinant's one. Because the next thing we're going to do in another lecture or two is the non-causal case, which is actually more the central focus of this class. And there, you're not going to have a lower triangular matrix, and the determinant's not one. And that messes everything up. Okay. Yeah. Okay? Good. Actually, those are really good questions. And those are the kinds of questions you can only ask after you've read the notes really carefully. Okay? So, so that means then that's the probability density function for x, right? Yes. So that means that the mean is that sum with filters and then the variance is sigma squared c? Uh, 
Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, what is like? Oh, it looks just like a Gaussian. So yeah, is that like the mean, and then the variance is sigma squared c, or my? You can sort of think about it that way because this is the conditional mean. It's the conditional mean of x n. But it's not. But it's not really the mean because it's x in there. Okay. So it, this thing here is the conditional mean of x n given x i for i less than n. Remember, because that's the minimum mean for error predictor. But yes, it does play the role of the mean, but it's a conditional mean, right? Okay. Does that make sense? So, so here, sense. so here, this expression right here, this is x n minus the conditional mean of x n given the path. I'll just write p there for the path. Okay. So yes, it is. This is a mean. You know, as I, I said before, and I'll say it, okay, when you ask me these questions, they're excellent questions, but very often what they do is they're like kind of intuitive questions that are getting at your gut feeling about the material, okay? My, it's hard for me to answer them, not that they're not valid questions, but it's hard to answer them because there's only two kinds of answers I can give. I can give a technically correct answer, which is intuitively unsatisfying to you. I mean, for that, I can just say, read the notes. Okay? Okay? But I understand where you're coming from. You have this feeling, and you want the feeling to be satisfied. Okay? But I can only answer your question by giving you my feelings about it. And everybody looks at it a little differently. So, I can, so when you ask me subjective questions, they're very valid. But I can only give you subjective answers. right? So I can try to give you different ways of looking at it to help satisfy the intuition need you want, okay? Uh, but unfortunately, it's, it's, I don't know how to answer it in an absolutely unequivocally precise way, okay? Because it's not an unequivocally precise question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the way I'm going to try to do that is to give you different perspectives on it, and then you can draw out of that the best way to think about it for you, okay? You know, uh, math is like an interesting thing. Um, you know, uh, people often say, well, math is, is, is like, you know, right or wrong. Well, that's true, and it's not true. That, yes, there is a verification. When someone gives you a sequence of steps in math, you can check each step and check that it's either true or false. But if someone says, uh, but there's a huge creative uh, aspect of mathematics. It's like art, and you say, well, what's interesting to prove? There's no way to prove what's interesting. <laughs> it's not, what's interesting to me may not be interesting to you. Right? It's a subjective evaluation, and it has to do with your elegance. So, math is very much a creative, uh, uh, a creative endeavor, okay? It does have a verification aspect to it, but it's extremely creative, okay? So your creative questions are very important, but they're hard for me to answer and a completely precise way. Okay, now, um, all right. So, now, um, good. Uh, now, okay, two keys. How do you, we only have like one minute and 30 seconds. You can go to two keys. So, AR models depend upon causality. So, how are you going to deal with causality? Well, in one D, you can order the points like this, right? In two, you got to do something. So the thing that people usually do is so-called raster ordering, left to right, top to bottom, because English-speaking countries develop television standards, and they did this way. Okay, and now we're stuck with it. Okay. So now, fine. Okay, so that's the path. It's kind of a strange concept of path. Right. Now, uh, you can everything goes through. You do everything the same. You have a different idea about the path. You need to read this. And then what happens is the matrices are not hopeless and circulant, they're block hopeless and block circulant. Okay? So block hopeless and block circulant corresponds to 2D operations. Okay? And then everything goes through. It's pretty much the same deal. I'm going to let you read it. The equations are the same. Everything's the same. Okay? It's just 2D. So that's interesting, but not um, like hugely different. Okay? But we only have 10 more seconds. So, um, so what you're going to do then 
is we'll do this. You're going to read those chapters and make sure you understand it, and I'll see you on Monday. That's the end.